The Drug Alternative Program presents Drugs Close to Home, your weekly insight into the ongoing stories of struggle, victory, and the spiritual renewal of rehabilitation. Each week, Cliff and Freddie Harris would like to introduce you to the many people who have touched their lives through their spirit-filled ministry. But most of all, they would like to share with you the blessings they continue to receive from Jesus Christ. And now, your hosts of Drugs Close to Home, Cliff and Freddie Harris. Freddie, are you excited about our first program? I am excited. And we hope that you are excited because we'll be bringing you these programs each week into your home. You know, Cliff and I are co-founders of Drug Alternative Program. This is a 12 to 18 month residential program for men addicted to drugs right here in Grand Terrace, California. And you know, we have had so many success stories, so many people to cross our lives. We just said we cannot keep these blessings to ourselves. Just a minute, Freddie. Do you know what? We are excited about that because we want to let you know what God has done for us in our lives. And you know, during these series of programs that we're going to be doing, we're going to let you know that what he's done for us in our life, he will do for you in your life. You know, before we tell you our stories, we want to tell you a little about ourselves. And I could think of no better way of doing that than for me to interview you, honey, and for you to interview me. Now listen, Freddie, you have to be careful now you, what you're going to ask me, you know, because I might have some private things I might not want to <laughs> say. But really, you guys, my life is an open book, and we want to let you know what God has done for us in our lives. And now, honey, I thought the first thing I would do is to read the introduction that I read for you every time we have a speaking now, engagement. Now, before you read that, Freddie, you know, every time Freddie reads this introduction for me, uh, I have to relive my life again, and that's not a, a good thing for me to do. But we're going to do that. Listen very closely now. The man that I have the privilege of presenting to you today has a long history of success in his field. His accomplishments are many. First of all, he's an honor graduate of the Colorado State Penitentiary, receiving his bachelor's degree in burglary in 1977. He returned in 1983 and received his master's degree in larceny on January 3, 1984. Prior to completing his higher ed education, he enrolled in numerous institutions, including the Denver County Jail, Arapahoe County Jail, Adams County Jail, Lake Alfred, Florida County Jail, Long Beach, California County Jail. Now his elementary schooling included the Dallas City Jail, Auburn, Ohio City Jail, Denver City Jail, and the Aurora City Jail. Now his professional experiences include 10 years as a heroin addict, eight years as a cocaine addict, with 20 years of marijuana use, and five years of amphetamines and barbiturates. Now his direct experiences include robbery, direct IV injection, burglary, extortion, assault and battery, larceny, contempt of court, filthy language, trespassing, and possession of narcotics. But today he comes to you a new creature in Christ with over 20 years of sobriety a new wife and family, owner of a home, president of Drug Alternative Program, and a published author, having recounted his addiction and redemption in his autobiography, Death Dance. It's with great pleasure that I present to you Mr. Cliff Harris. Thank you, Fred. Now, honey, I want you to tell the audience a little more about yourself. What about your childhood? Well. You know, I was raised in a Christian home. My father always um, woke us all up in the household. Before he went to work, we would have family worship together. He always took us to church. Uh, we would have family worship in the evenings. But, you know, as a child, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a dysfunctional family. But I know one thing, I had low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, they always called me the ugly boy. 
And you know, I used to wonder if I was adopted, you know, because all my other brothers and sisters looked a little different from right. me. Right, you're the only one that's dark yeah. with kinky hair. Yeah. Everyone else is light complected and straight hair. And so I remember asking my mother one time, was I adopted? And she was like, oh boy, what's the matter with you, you know? <laughs> But that stayed with me, and so that had an effect upon my life in some sense. Right. Now, what about your marriage? Well, um, I always wanted to be like my father, where my mother, uh, she never did work. You know, my father always took care of the whole family uh, um, situation. And I wanted to be just like my father. I, I wanted, I didn't want my wife to work and I didn't want her to do all this. I would be the totally one that would take care of everything. The breadwinner. The breadwinner. I was the breadwinner of the family, but it didn't work out that way too well. And so How I lost that. Well, I didn't get married until I was 21. And um, when I got married, I didn't start using drugs until I was. Uh, had had three children, and that's when I started using marijuana. And I can remember when the guys first introduced that marijuana to me, I got upset with them. But um, from being wanting to be one of the fellas, I started smoking the marijuana with them. I wanted to be part of what they were doing. And from marijuana, I went into doing heroin. You know, for me to stick a needle in my arm, you know, um, right now, I've got two marks on this arm and two on this arm, and those marks will be there the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had, had gotten so bad till I was uh, spending as much as $150 a day on heroin. I remember you told me one night you spent $800. And, you know, actually, that's a small amount mm -hmm. because I've known people to spend $2,000 on, on heroin. But... Um, and when you start doing those things, you start going down. You lose your values that you've been raised with. You know, when you really think about me, can you look at me right now, Freddie? I, I look pretty good. You're a pretty handsome yeah, guy. <laughs> thank you, Freddie. But at one time, I had hair on my head like this, a mustache like this. I would not change my clothes. I would keep them on for two to three weeks at a time. Would not even, don't even take a bath. Don't even take the clothes off because I'm so down in the gutter. And that's where Satan takes us. That we'll takes us, Satan will take us down into the gutter that I thought I would never go. But that's where I went. Well, what about your jail life and your prison life? Well, um, I've been in the Colorado State Penitentiary twice. Um, I've been to jail in California, Ohio, Florida, uh, Texas. I can't remember the rest, mm -hmm. but there's some old, New York. I've been to all those places in jail. Um, as far as my children go, I stole from my children, stole from my wife. You know, and when you're doing these things, you say that you love your children, but you don't love them. Because, you know, my ex-wife used to say to me, if you loved me, you wouldn't hurt me. And, you know, that's true. God says the same thing to us. If you loved me, you would obey me. I remember you telling me the 17th Street episode. Share that with the audience. Well, the seven, I was, one day I, I was looking for drugs all day long. I'd been going down on Five Points, standing on the corner, waiting for the drug dealers to come or going to this house or that house, and I couldn't cop. And Cop, what does that mean? Cop <laughs> means to get your drugs, okay. you know, to buy them or, right. you know, someone to give them to you. But I ended up around about 5 or 6 o'clock in that evening, finally, um, I had gotten some drugs, and I was flying down 17th Street. I'll never forget this. Uh, on my way home to get down with my drugs. Well, I ended up, and I thought about this. I was flying, and I thought, here you are, Clifford, putting all this energy into obtaining this drug. Mm -hmm. Now, if you could turn that energy around for the positive, what a force I would be. 
And I thought about that very seriously that day. But I still went home and got down anyway. I still used my drugs. And I thought about if I could help someone not go through life what I was going through. Because my life was, at that point, was in turmoil. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you have three children. Now, all of your 20 years of drugs, what, mm -hmm. have been, what has been their experience? Um, my experience with my children, their experience has been... Um, have they ever used drugs? No. None of my children what have ever a used miracle. drugs. Yes, that's a miracle. But I remember my daughter telling me this. She told me um, uh, we were in the hospital, and her daughter was going through an operation. And we were sitting in the cafeteria at the hospital, and my daughter said to me, Daddy, I want you to go head on with your life. You move on with your life because, you know, she didn't say it, but she meant was that I had disappointed her so much in her life that she wanted me to move on. And you know one thing I said to her, Freddie? I didn't give her any indication of saying or comment on to her what I was going to do. I just, not going to do anything special. I was just going to be a father and do what I needed to do in my life. And I kept doing it. And you know what? It's amazing, but all three of your children love you today. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you know, one thing, what ended up was, she always would, Daddy, are you coming over to get the kids? You want the kids to come down and get them? And you know, now my, my grandkids, they call me Grandpa, Grandpa, when you gonna call, when you coming to see me? That kind of thing. So that's, that's been the part that I treasure the most in my life. It's a miracle. Yes. Because to have been on drugs for 20 years and not one of your children addicted, it's a miracle. Yes, it's a miracle. And you know, one thing I remember you telling me, honey, is that since you have been clean and sober, you have had not one temptation to use drugs again. You know, so many people, I've heard stories of pastors saying, you know, I still have that temptation sometimes. I still mm -hmm. have that taste in my mouth. And you, now you even have very few dreams. You know, yeah. and I always say, the Lord did that for you because he gave you this ministry, Drug Alternative Program, and he did not want that to be a temptation to you. But you know, there's one story on the next part of the program that I want to share with the audience. I want to share this story with you, and we'll be right back with that. Okay, Freddie? Okay. How, how about us doing that? Good. Okay. I'm Joey Kibble of Take Six, and we'll be right back. Yeah. Do we need him? Yeah. Do we need him? Yeah. The Drug Alternative Program, founded in 1987 by Cliff and Freddie Harris, is a well-rounded, Christian-based drug rehabilitation program. DAP has been helping men break free from drug addiction and other life-controlling problems. The 12 to 18 month long inpatient program is a safe, structured, and drug-free environment for men 18 to 64 years of age. Clients begin their program in one of the two recovery homes operated by DAP in Grand Terrace, California. DAP also operates a transition home for graduates of the program who need help redefining their place as a productive member of society. Life in the homes is structured in a manner that promotes responsibility, good work ethic, teamwork, and daily devotion to Jesus Christ. The DAP day starts at 5.30 a.m. with healthy meals prepared by the men. Upkeep is a responsibility that is shared by all the men who live in each of the three homes. Following their daily duties, the men share a morning devotional led by co-founder Freddie Harris. 
daily devotion is a key component of the road to recovery for those enrolled in the DAP program. Many have been amazed by the high rate of success of DAP. Faith-based treatment programs like DAP have a 60 to 80 percent success rate compared to only about 10 percent success rate for traditional rehabilitation programs. While most drug rehabilitation programs depend fully on outside financial resources to operate, DAP looks to innovative self-reliance. DAP operates a professional lawn and landscaping service that serves the local and surrounding communities. Also, the lawn business pays for half of the recovery expenses for these guys. So they'll help them to pay for their recovery, which, you know, the families appreciate. The program helps to instill good work ethic among the men and help them back to a life of daily responsibility, pride, and leadership. Addicts cannot have no idle time. And that's why the program has to be structured so that at the end of the day, they're ready to go to bed. When clients have completed the 12 to 18 month program, they graduate into a spiritually renewed drug-free life. This physical and spiritual rebirth is indeed a cause for celebration. Today, DAP is adding an outreach ministry to their recovery program. With 21 years of practical experience, DAP wants to serve as a resource for pastors, key church and community leaders, educators, professionals, high school and college students, and families who feel the impact of substance abuse. Through workshops and seminars, DAP can train others how to identify, address, and harness resources for church and community members with addiction issues. It will also provide internet and telephone support services for those committed to living a life free from addictions. Welcome back. Cliff, you said in the last segment that you wanted to share stories about yes. your family. Uh, I want to share a story about my mother. Um, this is a very important part of, of my life that I really remember. Um, my mother had cancer and she was dying of cancer. Where was she living at that time? Um, my mother and father lived in Lake Alfred, Florida at that time, and I was in Colorado in Denver, and I had a case, and I was out on bond, and I knew I was going back to the penitentiary. There was no ifs and ands and buts about that. This was my second stay that I was getting ready to do back in the Colorado State Penitentiary. Is that the time you took the children with you to Florida? Yeah. Yes, that's the time that my ex-wife let me take the kids. She let a drug addict take her she children to Florida? She let me take the kids to Florida with me when I went. Did you have and money? No, had no money. I had, I had gotten a stolen credit card, mm. and I had about maybe $15, $20 cash money. And I drove all the way to Florida on a stolen credit card, Freddie. And, and $15. I fed, and I gave, buy the kids a little 
um, hamburger here and there, little cheap hamburgers, and I just drove straight through mm. from Colorado to Florida to see my mother who was dying of cancer. Now, I want you in the audience to think about this. I go down to Florida. I have a case. I'm still using drugs. My life is a mess. And I go down there to see my dying mother on her dying bed. And you know what happened to me when I went down there, Freddie? Don't tell me you use drugs. Oh, yes. I was busted with some marijuana, walked in a liquor store with a marijuana joint in my mouth. Mm. And there were some detectives in there, and they arrested me. That was pretty bold of you. Very bold of me. And the thing of it was, I had to call my father to come and bond me out of jail to get me out. And my, to call my daddy, and he said, well, he would come and pick me up. He would get me in the morning. I said, no, daddy, I don't want those kids to wake up, and I'm not at home. You got to come get me tonight. Right. My father came and got me that night. I went back home to my mom and dad's. Now imagine, this is what my mother said to me. Mm. Was she happy to see you? No. What did she say? When I went in the bedroom, my mother was in the bed. And she was very ill. This was the last stage of her life. Mm. And my mama says to me, my mama, good mama, Christian mama. She says to me, Clifford, I wish you had never come to see me because I know you were still on that stuff. Here is your mama telling you that she did not want to see me. That's devastating. That's something that has stayed with me all of my life. And I remember you telling me about her calling your brother Gene. Well, she called my brother Gene, who lived in Jersey, and he came down, but I never knew why he was there. But he never, my brother Gene never did say anything to me about that. So, you know, that was part of what I went through. Mm -hmm. But he never did say anything, but it was a mess that, but I always had in my mind that what if my mother died while I was in the penitentiary? It was something that I never could live down. But when she did die, um, I was able to attend her funeral. That was a blessing. A blessing. And I know no, nobody did that but God. Mm -hmm. God worked that out for me because that would have been a devastating blow to me in my life. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about your children. I remember a story you told me about your son Jeffrey when you were washing the car. Well, with my son Jeffrey, uh, he was about two years old. Maybe, maybe, no, I would say maybe two or three, just beginning to walk. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, um, I was washing the car and I had I had bought me a whole bag of marijuana that I was going to smoke this marijuana and I was going to cruise in the car and, and drive, you know, and get high. Well, Jeffrey was out in, out there with me while I was washing, washing the, the car. car. Mm -hmm. Well, he got a hold of the bag of marijuana. Mm. Now, he didn't dump this marijuana on the sidewalk. He dumped it in the grass. Marijuana is green. Yes. And so it was wasted when he dumped it out. Do you know, I was so angry with him that, you know, I spanked him very much. An innocent child. Innocent child. He did not even know. But because of my anger, I, I really whipped him. Mm. Wow. Now, remember the story you told me about Rhonda, who was a debutante, getting ready to enter into society. Yes. Well, my daughter... She was going to um, be, be a, a, a debutante that night. It was on a Saturday night. And, you know, all the fathers are supposed to march their daughters down the aisle. Well, I was so high that night that she had to hold me up. Mm. Wow. And that was, you know, a devastating thing that, you know, those kind of things that happened in my life. 
But you know what, Freddie? All of those things God has, has brought me out of mm -hmm. and has changed my life in a sense that, you know, now we're doing drug alternative program because I want to help somebody not go through life what I went through. But there are more stories that, you know, we'll hear about them as long as, you know, we're doing these programs that you will know a little bit more about. Right. And, you know, you are a miracle. Yes. You know, it says that every conversion is a miracle. And my husband is a miracle. Crazy. And I had no Crazy. idea that I would be married to you. <laughs> <laughs> and one of these segments, we're going to tell my story. But you know, on our next program that we'll do, let's talk about you and so the audience so that you'll get to know who Freddie is. We'll do that. I will interview <laughs> you, and I'm going to interview you too, <laughs> Freddie. And listen, you guys, I got to tell you this, so this will whet your appetite a little bit. She's had almost 11 marriages, <laughs> okay? Now, how many times have you been married, Freddie? We'll tell you that in the next program. No, well, let's find out now. Tell us how many times have you been married. I'm pressing you because I want to, this one is going to be a good program. I'll tell you that I married my first husband. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not fair, Freddie. Just answer the question. How many times have you been married? I've been married five times. Five times? But. But, no, oh, no. We're not no but. We'll okay. wait that. We'll wait and tell the audience. Now, don't forget. Tune in next week and we will tell you all about her five marriages. <laughs>